Isaiah chapter number 5. Dear Heavenly Father, we sure do love you. It's good to be in church tonight. We thank, thank you for this church. Thank you for how you've met with us here this week. And thank you for the soul that was saved last night. We just give you glory and praise for that. And I pray you help us tonight for a few minutes. Lord, thank you for the Bible. And I pray that you would touch us, fill us, and use us as we preach the Word of God for a few moments tonight. And Lord, I pray you'll speak to our hearts. And I pray especially for that one that may be lost here tonight. They don't know that they're saved. I pray that you would convict them. And I pray you'd save that soul. And we'll give you glory and praise for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah chapter number 5, look at verse number 14. The Bible says, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. I want to preach tonight on the mouth of hell. The mouth of hell. March 1st, 2013, at 11 p.m. at night, Jeff Bush went to bed in his brother's home in Sefner, Florida. Several minutes later, he heard his brother Jeremy, or his brother Jeremy, felt the house just shake violently. And he heard his brother let out a blood-curdling scream. He ran into the room and saw that the entire room, including his brother, had been swallowed up by a huge sinkhole. As he leaned over that 60-foot deep sinkhole, he said he could briefly hear Jeff crying out for help until finally that voice faded. They dug around in that sinkhole for several weeks and they never did recover the body of Jeff Bush. Now, I remember the morning after that happened, Brother Foster, I was scrolling through the news and I came across that story and some of you might remember that, but I, I remember as I read that story, I was reminded of Korah. There in Numbers chapter 16. Listen to what the Bible said in Numbers 16 verse 32. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods. They went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. You, you say, what did that crowd do that got God so upset? They were just ungrateful, and disobedient, and they would not do things God's way. They wanted to do it their own way. Could I tell you, brother and sister, hell swallows and gulps quickly. And those that go there never come back. They never get a second chance. There's never another opportunity. If you die without Christ and go to this place called hell, it is final. It is forever. And there is no back door, side door. It's everlasting fire and torment and pain and darkness and screaming and weeping and wailing. I think for whatever reason, somewhere along the way, we've gotten this idea that hell's just not really all that bad or, or maybe it's just not even real. I'm telling you, according to the Word of God, it is a real place. Uh, tonight, while we're in here enjoying this church service, uh, there are untold millions, if not more, that are burning in this place, uh, this literal, real place tonight. Some have been there for just a few moments. And some have been there for thousands of years. And they'll never have another chance. And they squandered whatever chances they may have had. Isaiah chapter 5 here lays out several thoughts about this place called hell. Number one tonight, I want us to look at the dimensions of hell. There in verse 14 it said, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself. There's a couple questions that come to my mind when I read that, 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 that verse that hell hath enlarged herself. Why does hell enlarge herself? Matter of fact, Brother Cody talked about predestination last night and the fact that predestination is for those who have already been saved. Romans chapter number 8, Paul begins writing by, therefore, it, therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Right. He's writing to those that are in Christ. But if what the Calvinists, what they teach about predestination is right, then why does hell enlarge itself? 
Seems to me it would already be fixed. But it says here that it enlarges itself. i tell you why hell enlarges itself. Because so many people in this world go through their life, they, they give no thought to Jesus. They give no thought to the Word of God and the things of God. They give no thought to the fact that there is another life after this one and it is forever, it is forever throughout eternity. And you'll go to one of two places. It's either heaven or it's hell. And if you're going to go to heaven, you're going to go by the cross and through the blood of Jesus. Jesus Christ and if you miss that there's only one other alternative there is no purgatory there is no soul sleep there is no limbo it's either heaven or it's hell and so many people live their life the way they want to live it doing what they want to do and what feels good to them and they die and go to hell and so hell is making room for the untold thousands and even millions that are going to do their thing their way and give no regard to God and His Word. There's another question that comes to my mind. How does hell enlarge itself? Now, Brother Jordan, I, I believe there's enough Scripture to prove that hell is literally in the heart of this earth that we're on tonight. There's enough Scripture to support the fact that it's literally in the heart of this earth. I'm not going to run all the Scripture tonight. You come see me after church and we'll scroll through the Bible and I'll show you some verses that support that thought tonight. It's literally under your feet tonight. What I'm going to say next, I cannot prove from Scripture. It's just my own thinking. You can take it or leave it. I personally believe that every time you see images of all those volcanoes erupting, when we turn on the news and we see all that hot lava flowing out of mountains, I believe that's hell making room for more sinners that died without Jesus Christ. I remember a couple years ago, there, they had that big volcano eruption over there in Hawaii and, and we saw all kind of images and videos and, and, I, and I saw a video of a, a, a lake of lava just flowing through a subdivision. And it, it, that, that little lake of that lava was flowing up toward, toward a car and I thought maybe, maybe that car will slow it down or stop it. You know what that lava, it just immersed that car and when it, when it was done, the car was gone. Let me ask you something, sinner friend. Could you imagine spending eternity no end never stops being immersed in something that hot a lake of lava like that and you are just immersed in it forever it's not, it's not some kind of a nightmare that you wake up from it's a nightmare that never ends the Bible tells us it's, it's measureless it said therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without Measure. You know, no one's ever died and gone to hell and been met by somebody to say, sorry, there's no room for you. Oh, no, no, no. It'll make room for you if you die without Christ. It's not only measureless, but it's bottomless. Revelation 20 verse 3 calls it the bottomless pit. No bottom to it. You know what else you do in hell? You fall, but you never hit bottom. There ain't no bottom. You just fall while you're burning, while you're suffering, while you're screaming. You just, you're falling. I, I, I try not to fall asleep on my back because when I do, I don't know, Brother Doug, I don't know if it's a sensation or if it's a dream, but I feel like I'm falling. As, as I'm dozing off to sleep, I have this sensation that I'm falling. Some of you are nodding your head like you know what I'm talking about. And eventually I kind of jar myself awake. It's an awful feeling. You die and go to hell, you ain't jarring yourself awake because you're not asleep. It's reality. You're falling, you're burning, you're suffering, you're screaming, you're wailing. Hey, something about, else about hell, it's insatiable. Proverbs 27 verse 20 said, Hell and destruction are never full. It's always hungry for just a little bit more. It's never satisfied. It wants more. Not only do we see the dimensions of hell, but secondly, I see the descension of hell. Let's keep reading verse 14, middle of the verse. And their glory. 
and their multitude and their pomp. And he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. Now, I see that verse, that word there, it says, and their glory. That speaks of the marvels of mankind. That that speaks of the things that, that we as human beings, we look at and we go, wow, that's impressive. Wow, look at that. Ain't that something? Right. You realize, brother and sister, the things in this life that we look at, that we're so impressed with, God's not one bit impressed with them. Right. Right. The things that man can make and come up with, God's not impressed with that stuff. Everybody's so impressed with the technology of our day. God's not impressed with our technology. Matter of fact, man, tech, we, were, we were better off before all this technology came along. Now, don't I'm not preaching against that tonight. I'm not going to give an invitation, ask you to give up your cell phones for Jesus or anything like that. I got one, it comes in handy. But let's just be honest, we were better off before smartphones, before social media, before television and Hollywood, we, we were better off before all we were better off before twenty four seven news stations. We was better off for all that. <coughs> and people are so impressed with all the technology. God's not. People are so impressed with all, all our buildings in America, they'll come to America and go to New York City to check out all the skyscrapers. They want to come see them and take pictures. <coughs> God's not impressed. <coughs> we look at those buildings and we go, wow. God's not one bit impressed. Matter of fact, if you want to know what God <coughs> excuse me, thinks about cities, look at verse number 8 of our chapter. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. God's not impressed with our cities. Matter of fact, He never intended it for it to be that way. Now, I'm not fussing anybody that lives in a city or that works in a city or that pastors in a city. I'm, I'm thankful for preachers that are reaching those in the cities of America. <coughs> but that's not the way God intended it for it to be. Have you ever noticed in the cities there's more crime? That there's more liberal mentality? And God's not one bit impressed with it. I kind of like where I live, man. I live out in the middle of the cornfields. I kind of like it that way. I can't see any neighbors where I live. <coughs> Brother Doug, stand up and pray for me, please. Oh, yes. Lord, I certainly pray for the man of God. Touch his throat. God, you give him liberty. God, you help pour out of him the message that is needed for the hour. I pray that you anoint our ears that we not only be hearers only, but become doers of the word of God. Yes, help us, Lord. I pray for that one here tonight that is near as hell. Oh, God, I pray that, Lord, you that through course of love the Holy Spirit would draw them to an altar of repentance. God, I pray that you make hell real in their hearts tonight. Yeah, please do God, it, Lord. I pray that they fear lest they take their final breath and end up there. God help them. I pray for the saints of God, they get a fresh sense of hell. Yeah. Lord, that they get a burden for souls, get a burden to tell God, us. God help us. Help us, please. Amen. Thank you, preacher. I may need. I don't usually like to have stuff in my mouth when I'm preaching. 
Hopefully it don't go flying out and <coughs> being somebody right in the forehead. I'm going to be honest with you. I've preached this message several times. I agonize over this message. I, I, I remember preaching this one time down in Georgia. And as right as I was getting into the midst of it, a little toddler just started vomiting right there in the church. And, and it was a distraction. Back was preaching in North Carolina back in the fall. And we was doing a tent meeting. And uh, several car alarms just went off right at the same time. And uh, it's, I don't think the devil likes this message. <coughs> but <clears throat> God, we're not going to let him have the victory. <clears throat> he talks about the marvels of mankind. But then he goes on, he said in verse 14, not only their glory, but he said their multitude, and that speaks of the majority of mankind. I, I, I hate to say this tonight, but according to the Word of God, if you've studied your Bible and read your Bible, there are more people that will die and go to hell than that will go to heaven. And it's not that God didn't pay for their sins on the cross. He paid for the sins of all mankind. He tasted death for every man, but not every man will trust Him. Not every man will come to Him. Not every man and woman, boy and girl will repent. And sadly, there are more that die and go to hell than go to heaven. And that breaks my heart. But it's just a, a fact from the Scriptures tonight. And you don't have to be part of that majority here. If you're lost without God tonight, you can be saved. We'll take a Bible tonight and show you how to have eternal life through Jesus Christ. You don't have to die and go to hell. If you do die and go to hell, you're going to have to step over Calvary. You're going to have to step over the blood. You're going to have to step over God's Word. You're going to have to step over Emmanuel Baptist Church. But a lot of people are determined that they're going to do it their own way and go against God. Matthew 6 verse 13 said, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life. And few, and few, there be that find it. And then he, then he goes on to say this, and their pomp. That speaks of the majesty of mankind. That word pomp means a show of magnificence. Something that we parade, something that we put on display. Matter of fact, coming up here in the next few weeks or months, they'll start having graduations and high school and college, and as they march onto the stage, they play that da 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 da, -da pomp and circumstance. And what, they're, what we're doing is we're honoring... We're recognizing the accomplishments of what they've worked so hard for, and rightfully so, by the way. Now the problem is, is we've now taken sin and put that on display. We've taken things that go against God and His Word and we're parading it down the streets of America. We're parading it in the stores of America and in our corporations and companies and now even churches are embracing sin that goes directly against the Word of God and we just put it on display like it's no big deal. Look at verse number 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. There are those in our society that say that sodomy is good, and same-sex marriage is good, and straight's just bad. There are those that say that pro-choice is good and pro-life is evil. There are those that say fornication and immorality and adultery is good and marriage is just old fashioned and, and, and you know, you know, it ain't no re just try it before you buy it. Shack up a little bit. Ain't no sense of hey, hey, I'm telling you, God's word hasn't changed. We just put these things on display like it's no big deal. And too many churches in America have embraced these things. And too many preachers in our land have grown quiet about it. And they don't want to talk about sin. 
They don't want to name sin. Well, you know, I'm afraid I'm going to offend somebody. I'm not out to offend anybody, but hey, if the Word of God offends you, you've got to take it up with the book. Amen. And we're not preaching to hurt you. We're, we're not preaching to try to put on a show and show how tough we are or just for the sake of being controversial. I'm trying to help you. Some of you, you'll get mad at your preacher. I don't know why he had to say that, or I wish he'd leave that stuff alone. I mean, he's making my youngins uncomfortable. He's just trying to help your family. Trying to keep your family out of hell. Amen. Thank God for preachers that'll still stand and preach the book with the power of God on their life. We just put these things on parade. Man, I think about a couple years ago as... Governor Cuomo there in New York was signing a, some legislation uh, that was going to take abortion even further. And that smirk on his face. And all the other lawmakers that were standing around him as they stood there with their grins on their face. You think they ain't going to stand before God one day and give an account for taking the lives of all those unborn babies? And so will everybody that voted them in the office. Give an account. The majesty of mankind. But then he goes even further. He says in verse 14, And he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. And that speaks of the merriment of mankind. Now listen, the Bible here is not talking about people that are rejoicing in the Lord. Man, we've done some rejoicing here this week. Amen. Paul said rejoice in the Lord always. And again. And again. And again. I mean, he must have known how dead Baptists were going to be in 2021. And again, I say rejoice. Oh, as God's people, we got much to rejoice about. What the book is talking about right here is those that, ha that find their joy, they find their temporary happiness, they find their merriment in the things and pleasures and vices of this whole world. Right. Verse 11, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink that continue until night till wine inflame them. And speaking about those that get their pleasure from alcohol and booze, those that get their pleasure from dope, those that get their pleasure from immorality and immoral relationships. Hey, by the way, can I just take a time out and say, I'm glad I don't have to go to the world to have a good time. I'm glad I don't have to go to the bar, amen, to get a buzz. I'm glad I don't have to go to dope, amen, to get high. Hey, I've been high on Jesus for 20-something years now. It's the best high you'll ever get on. It's the best buzz you'll ever have. I say glory to God. I don't want what the world has to offer. I've got Jesus, hallelujah. I got enough to rejoice about in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thirdly tonight, I see the dwellers of hell. Look at verse 15. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. People might say, who, who, who goes to hell? You know what most people are going to say? If we went out knocking on doors and said, who do you think goes to hell? They'd say, well, bad people. Well, let's just go ahead and set the record straight here tonight. We're all bad people. Apart from Jesus Christ, we're all bad. But here he gets pretty specific. He said, the mean man shall be brought down. Now, could we be honest tonight, church? We probably all got a little bit of meanness in us. Right. Now, I got three or four honest people this evening. <laughs> yeah. Amen. We've all woken up on the wrong side of the bed a time or two. Yeah. We've all gotten in five o'clock traffic in Cincinnati. And that meanness starts rising up. Brother Doug, if I was honest, I'd probably say there's been times over 20 years of preaching, I was probably mean in the pulpit. And shame on me for it. We've all got some meanness in us. So who's the mean man? Hey, who I think it is. I think it's that man or that woman that lives their entire life 
just being mean to people. The only thing that brings them any kind of satisfaction is being mean to other people and, and seeing the displeasure of other people. They get, they, there's something about that. It just gives them pleasure. And those kind of people go to church too. I'm talking about the kind of people that they'll go to church their whole life, but they're not here to worship. They're not here to fellowship. They're not here to sing. They're not here for preaching. They're just here to make sure that preacher does everything the way they want him to do it. They're just here to make sure nobody comes in that they don't want to come in. They're just here, amen, to make sure the business meeting goes how they think it ought to go. They're just here to stir stuff up. And I've seen people sit in churches. I mean, they've been there for decades. They don't love God. They don't love the Bible. They're there for one thing, and that's just to run the church. You say, what is that? That's mean. That's mean. And that kind of stuff came out of hell, and that's exactly where it's going back to. Mean man. But then he said this, the mighty man in verse 15 shall be humbled. That mighty man speaks of those that have great power. I think about the kings and the queens down through the ages. I think about the politicians of our day that, that, that have great power to the point that many of them even abuse their power. But those that have power still need Jesus to go to heaven. Nobody's going to get into heaven just by what their position was on this earth. Well, I was president. Doesn't matter. I was king of such and such country. Doesn't matter. Everybody's got to come by the cross if you want to go to heaven. And if you don't, you die and go to hell. Do you realize tonight hell is full of people that had great positions and great power upon this earth, but they're nothing, amen, they're nothing but a worm burning in hell tonight. No matter how much power they had, their power does not overrule God's power. I think about the prosperous crowd, that crowd that has accumula accumulated much money, much wealth. But they ain't got enough money to buy their way into heaven. Not a one of them has stood before God at the white throne judgment and said, but Lord, look at all the money I made. You can't take it with you. The Bill Gates of the world and the Jeff Bezos and even the Trumps, they need Jesus. I think about the popular crowd, the celebrities, the sports stars, the actors, the singers. Doesn't matter how popular they were. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter how many people showed up as they filled up coliseums to hear them sing or, or, or to fill up a theater to watch their movie. It doesn't matter how popular they were. And they got to have Jesus. Amen. By the way, we look at that crowd out in Hollywood and we see the mansions and, and the fancy cars and all the money and people go, oh man, I wish I could have that fame. I wish I could have that fortune. I wish I could have what they have. You realize most of them actors out in Hollywood, they don't even get to spend many nights in them mansions because most of them are in rehab because their money hadn't satisfied them. Their fame and fortune has not satisfied them. They need Jesus. Oh, Lord, I'm so-and-so. Don't you know who I am? No. I never knew you. Depart from me into everlasting fire. But then he said in verse 15, And the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. It speaks of the majestic man. That man that would say something like this, well, I, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. Or I, I'm a self-made man. Hell is full of self-made men and women. That they did some great thing, they accomplished some great feat. They thought that made them something and they felt like they didn't need Jesus. Jesus. I'm just trying to say tonight that there's no person that's too bad for heaven if you come to Christ. But there is no person too good for hell if you reject Christ. 
There is no partiality when it comes to heaven and when it comes to hell. The rich die and go to hell without Jesus and the poor die and go to hell without Jesus. People of all racial backgrounds, amen, doesn't matter what color, what race you are, all that matters is do you know Jesus? People of all denominations and religious affiliations die and go to hell without Jesus. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean so I'm in church. You can go stand in your garage. It don't make you a car. And being in this church building tonight don't make you a Christian. Well, I, I'm, I'm a Methodist. Well, Methodists go to hell if they don't know Jesus. I'm a Catholic. Catholics go to hell if they don't know Jesus. Well, I'm a Pentecostal. I'm Assembly of God, Church of God. They go to hell if you don't know Jesus. Oh, Brother Daniel, I'm good to go. I'm a, I'm a Baptist. Probably blow our mind tonight if we knew how many people that went to a Baptist church and had their name on a Baptist church roll are burning in hell tonight. But I'm, I'm a Baptist. Yeah, but do you know Jesus? church members people that went to Christian school deacons deacons wives deacons children Sunday school teachers singers, choir members, musicians preachers, preachers wives preachers children, amen it does not matter what your position is, all that matters is have you been to Calvary and do you know Jesus Notice the declaration of hell in verse 16. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment. Hadn't heard Joel Osteen preach that message lately. Ever. We preached on the love of God Sunday night. I'm thankful for the love of God. But there's another side. The Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment. And God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. You know what the cries of hell declare this evening? They declare that God is high. He shall be exalted in judgment. Not His love. He's exalted in His judgment. You know what the cries of hell, if we could hear them tonight, if we could discern them tonight, they would be saying, He is God. He is high. He is a God of judgment. I wish I would have trusted Him. I wish I would have got saved. All those that claim the title of the king of this and the king of that. Amen. You know what they're saying tonight? He is the only true and one king. Amen. He said, and God is holy. That's what, the, that's what the cries of hell declare tonight, that He's a holy God. People make the statement, you know, I just don't see how God would allow anybody to go to hell. I mean, that just don't seem like a loving God. He's a holy God. Why would He allow anybody to go to hell? You know what we all ought to ask ourselves tonight? Why would He allow any of us to go to heaven? That's the right question tonight. I ought to be on my way to hell. You ought to be on your way to hell. It's just the goodness and grace of God that we're saved and on our way to heaven tonight. He's holy. You know what the cries of hell declare tonight? If we could hear them tonight, I thought I had more time. I, I was just a teenager. Thought I had plenty of time. I didn't realize that day when I got in my car that a drunk driver would cross the line and run, hit me head on, and I'd slip out into eternity. I thought I had more time. Now it's too late. I was just listening to what my professor told me in my philosophy class down at the university. He said the Bible was just a book of fairy tales and fables. A 
Now they know that that was wrong. I need to finish tonight, but before I do, I want to tell you about the desire of heaven. Would you look at Isaiah chapter 1 real quickly? We've looked at what Isaiah says about hell. But in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse number 18... Now, and I realize he's writing specifically to the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. But I believe it's a, a standing invitation to anybody that will take heed to it. Come now. By the way, he said come now. Not tomorrow, not next week, not when you're in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s. I mean, I wonder how many people have died at a young age... And now they're in hell and they thought I had more. I, I thought I had more time. Right. Listen, I, I would be lying if I stood here tonight and said this is the last chance you'll ever have to get saved. I don't know that. But church, I'd also be lying if I stood up here and said, ah, you got plenty of time. Don't worry about that today. You're just a young man. You're just a young woman. You got plenty of time. I don't know. And neither do you. All I know, Brother Goodson, is we all have an expiration date. And not one of us know when that day or that hour is. And so he says in verse 18, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as well, church, could I tell you tonight, God loved you enough that He sent His Son to die on Calvary's cross uh, to pay your sin debt, but you've got to accept it, you've got to trust Him, you've got to believe, amen. But the offer stands tonight that you can come to Jesus. Uh, he stands with arms wide open saying, Come to me, come to me, come to me. I'll take you, I'll make you my own. Hey, that's what He did for me one day. I called on Him and He saved my soul from hell. I'm glad I don't have to go to that place. I'm glad I'll never smell the smoke. I'll never feel the flames. And it's all because of my Savior. And He wants to save you tonight, sinner friend. How can you reject that? How can you say no to that? But people do every day. Every week in church services all across the country and around the world. They hear the message of the gospel and they say, No, don't be that one. Listen to what Jonathan Edwards said in his sermon. Miss Renee, you can go ahead and be coming to the piano, please. He said, Unconverted men walk over the pit of hell on a rotten covering. And there are innumerable places in this covering so weak that they will not bear their weight. And these places are not seen. The wrath of God burns against them. Listen to me, sinner friend. Some of you are on dangerous ground tonight. You are standing on some dangerous ground. You think you've got plenty of time. You think your ways are working for you and they're really not. If you're not careful, you're going to take that next step, that last step one day, and hell is going to swallow you up. But you got an opportunity here tonight to be saved. you got an opportunity tonight to say no to the devil and yes to Jesus. But it's up to you what you do with it. If I could, Brother Doug, I'd drag them down there to the altar and get saved, but I can't, we can't do that. It's a personal thing. But if you'll step out and come tonight, we'll take a Bible. We'll show you how to be saved, how to have eternal life through Jesus Christ. You don't have to die and go to this place called hell. God wants to save you today if you'll trust Him. We're standing to our feet. Many have already come tonight, probably praying for loved ones that are lost. If you need to do that tonight, I would encourage you to do that. But if you need to be saved, you just step out to come, slip your hand up. We'll 
We'll get somebody down here to pray with you and talk with you. Don't die and go to this place called hell. Not when Jesus has paid the cost. Don't reject Him tonight. Lord, bless the invitation, please. Save lost sinners, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.